Hey, Dame. Yo. Do you happen to have any idea who this episode is brought to you by? <laughs> oh, I think I have a clue. I think I do. <laughs> this episode of Ergo is brought to you by Overcast, an independent podcast app that embraces the open world of podcasting instead of locking it down. No exclusives, no premium content, no paywalls, just a great podcast app for everyone. And if you know Ergo, we love independent and we love shit not being locked down. So <laughs> so go ahead and get Overcast for free on the App Store. Hey everybody, this is Ergo. Yes, it is. Isn't that the truth? We are here. I am Damon. I am Kiss. And we are back doing what we do. Got a special edition for you. We are about to do a little organizing deep dive with the home team, checking in with the defund CBD campaign over the past few years, but certainly over these last few months, there has been a concerted effort of a push for a treatment, not trauma referendum to reinvest resources from police budgets into mental health responders and to public mental health clinics. And we have with us phenomenal organizer, Delane Powerful. So we get into it in the conversation. We'll, we'll spell it all out. But basically, uh, too long, didn't read. On uh, November 8th, when you vote, if you're in the 33rd, 20th, or 6th ward here in Chicago, there will be a question on the bottom of your ballot about whether the city should reopen the closed mental health clinics and divert resources to a crisis response program uh, that takes money from policing and puts it toward addressing mental health needs. This has been a long fight to even get this on the ballot. We break down what that means, what that passing could make possible. And then after the election, we'll circle back with some members from the treatment on trauma team to talk about the results and what happens next in the fight to address the needs of our communities. And thank you to Delane. A lot of times we don't get this type of deep dive into real-time organizing, but even beyond the mechanics of referendum or getting signatures, really shared with us a personal story that we are grateful to have received and bear witness to of why this is important, not only to her, but for all of our people who have been harmed at the intersection of mental health care and confinement, incarceration, and policing so thank you to Delane and thank you to everybody from the campaign for all your hard work. We see you. We appreciate you. And this has been really historic. Even for folks listening outside of the city, I feel like this is an important example, an important experiment in what system change looks like in practice. We get into these very vague, abstract conversations about reform or non-reformist reforms and like, what does all that mean? And I believe that this is really a great example of that seemingly complex phrase, non-reformist reform. So for folks who are looking for practical approaches and civic engagement, this is for you. For the abolitionists out there, this is also for you. This is the most explicit, direct political organizing I've at least seen in the city of talking to thousands of people towards a distinct action about taking resources away from harmful systems, namely the Chicago Police Department, for that to be invested into healthcare, specifically mental health care. Um, and so, yeah, there's something in this effort for everyone, no matter where you sit, you know, so pick and choose, you know, it's it's... It's almost like sides. You can get something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if you're if you're at the sides buffet and you want to contribute to this fight, we'll put the link to sign up uh, to volunteer in this last week leading up to the election and then beyond in the show notes. We encourage you if you're in Chicago to plug into that. And of course, you can find out all about the campaign at Defund CPD Shy on Twitter um, and find all the information, including the volunteer sign up form there as well. All right, y'all. Let's dig deep with Delane powerful let's get to it oh uh delane what's your last name powerful powerful it sure is no, no. <laughs> yeah, you just fucked me up. <laughs> I laugh because I was expecting that's, the reaction. It is. That's so wrong. It's unclear where it comes from. Nobody knows. I have wow. no idea about that. So yeah, wait, wait, wait. Last like, name. Yo, yo, people's name. Like this is not a phenomenal. Yeah, no, the, prefer, the, the, the powerful no, family. Yes, there is powerful family. That is across, incredible. Across the Jamaica. 
You said across Jamaica? Across Jamaica. Ah, damn. Ah, damn. That's really fun. It's, That's it's, We've done a lot of ah, interviews. Damn. <laughs> That's maybe the rawest name we've ever heard in our life. <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate the affirmation. Yeah. I know, I know you're not you're not doing it for that, but just for what it's worth, what a what a win! It's a, a top notch fucking name. I never wow! That. All right, I'm sorry. It's okay. It's yeah. okay. You know, I'm I'm used to the response. I'm used no. to this. This is maybe the most exciting one. Yeah. yeah, that's the kind of family you marry into, just for the name, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so they say. <laughs> all right. Ooh. All right. Let me delete. No, no, no. Keep it. Keep it. Keep it. <laughs> keep that. Okay. <laughs> we all just right. got to see Damon's exuberance, you know? <laughs> all right. For sure. All right. We keep it that. All right. Let's rock. We are here. We are excited with us. <laughs> <laughs> It's me. <laughs> we, have, we have a powerful <laughs> organizer. The one us. and only. Uh, <laughs> the one and only from the Defund CBD campaign and the Treatment Not Trauma Push. We have the one and only Delay Powerful. Bra, 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 bra. Hey. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed by how amazing your name is. But we're going to kick off. I'm going to get my, my feet under me and we're going to ground ourselves in our tradition, our two part question that we kick off all of our conversations. And it's centered around time. So Delane, in this time, whether that's this day, this hour, this season, or this lifetime, how is the world treating you and how are you treating the world? Wow. In this current moment, I would say, you know, there's many things happening in this world. It is trying to expel us because we don't care for it. And at the same time, there's a lot of joy that I'm experiencing. Um, I'm caring for the world by being in it, by existing in it by finding things that the world gives to me that like produces joy. Um, and we're in my favorite season of autumn and the world is just giving it to me, all the colors, the burgundies, the greens, the, the yellows, um, the smells. That's how the world is giving things to me and I'm giving back in my favorite season. Yeah. Just based off of the, the, you know, the virtual image here, you do seem like a sweater, weather, sweater, wetter, sweater, weather aficionado. <laughs> Ooh, <same> yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes. Fall is my favorite, my favorite thing to do. Yes. Yeah, very autumnal. So in this autumn, we are in an election season. And for so long, we've talked about the frustration of electoral processes, particularly how picking the, the, the least of the evils of folks to represent us can be frustrating and demoralizing. And folks want to be politically engaged on more of the things that shape their communities and their lives. And I am excited to talk about what's been happening in the defund campaign and what's been happening with treatment and not trauma, because particularly from an abolitionist stance, uh, in my looking, I have not seen as robust a direct political engagement around police abolition and police divestment and reinvestment into community resources as what's been happening in three wards in the city of Chicago going into this November 8th election. And so with that as like the table setting of like, I'm super excited for our audience to be plugged in. And if there are any action items, we're going to get to that. But let's just kind of like go back and rewind. And maybe for folks that don't know none of the words that I just said, give some context to what is happening November 8th and from there, we can talk about all of the phenomenal work that has made that possible. Yeah. So November 8th is election day. And like Damon said, in them three wards, you have the 33rd, we have the 20th, and we have the 6th. Folks who live in those wards have a chance to vote yes on a referendum on the ballot. And that referendum ask if they believe the city of Chicago should reopen up all those mental health centers that were shut down by former mayors, Emmanuel and Daly. We don't like them. We don't love them. Boo. Um, boo. <laughs> boo. <laughs> and also to, uh, should, yeah, should Chicago have a non-police crisis response system that when folks are having mental health crises, they call and they send out a medically trained person, you know, an EMT, a paramedic, and also a mental health professional and a peer support, um, people who are actually trained in de-escalation to support that person going through crisis, again, rather than sending the police who always escalate and like induce and commit violence, especially for folks who are having mental health crises. So 
folks are going to have the chance to vote yes on that. And it's a non-binding referendum, but it really gives us a chance in the upcoming February elections to really hold folks accountable to what the people of Chicago of these three wars are saying they want. Because time and time again, they keep saying that for one, like Black folks don't know what they want. Black folks want the police and all these things, but they actually haven't been in conversation with the community, with these people. Um, And we have been talking to thousands upon thousands of people who are saying, we just say mental health and just like, yes, whatever it is, I want to say yes to it. So that's what's coming up and we're really excited for it. So you alluded to the the, the groundwork that y'all have done, which I think is part of what makes this so unique. Can you talk a little bit about what y'all have been doing leading up to this for the last few months and maybe some of the lessons that you've learned from being in those thousands of conversations? Yeah. I mean, I want to even go further a couple of years when this this thing popped off. So back in 2012, uh, the Chicago mayors, as I said before, Daly and Rom, they closed down 10 clinics. And the majority of those were in the South Side and the West Side, where it's predominantly Black and Brown people. In the absence of those clinics, they established private clinics instead. And these were clinics that most community members could not access because of the cost, because of the location, for an abundance of reasons. So for the past several years, this coalition called Collaborative for Community Wellness um, has been bringing together folks in the the mental health field, community-based organizations, and residents of the community to talk about like the lack of access to mental health um, and to figure out how to meet the needs of the community. And then the pandemic popped off in 2020 <laughs> and like the, the rates of like mental health and people and trauma, all those things just like increased tenfold. September 2020, the coalition launched the Treatment Not Trauma campaign, and that was introduced by Alderman Rosanna Rodriguez from the 33rd Ward. Shout um, out, shout out, gang, gang. Shout out, shout out, yes. Um, and seven other co-sponsors who were asking for the creation of this crisis response and a care model that would be integrated into the Chicago Department of Public Health's public mental health clinics. And again, this is like contextualized with, with, around the pandemic, this public health crisis where we saw like a very big rise in mental health issues by 25% because people were experiencing so many forms of instability, losing jobs and housing and access to health care and overwhelmed hospitals and care providers being completely overwhelmed. Um, like the kids were, the kids were not okay. And what we saw from the city of Chicago, from Lori Lightfoot. Boo. This and is please, boo. way more so booing and cheering budget. than we usually boo. do, but it feels right. You know? <laughs> but I'm ready I'm for into it. it. I'm into it. <laughs> In case you needed to know where we stand, you know. We're <laughs> <laughs> well, we Make we don't clear. like it, y'all. 40% of the Sorry. city's budget go into the police. One percent going into mental health services, and because this makes me laugh, I also want to say what some of the other parts of the budget went to. So, like thirty million went to privatize a section of Thirty First Street Beach. There was like a hundred million being put towards the river walk, and again, people are experiencing crises. And, and Mayor Lightfoot decides to put this money into all these things, and also to build a corresponder model where it was sending a police officer who was accompanied by a social worker to respond to mental health crisis emergencies, and those were completely centered around policing. As that happened, we moved into, we need to get some type of referendum on the ballot for the upcoming elections um, that is asking community members what they want, not what Mayor Lightfoot wants. And treatment not trauma is a defund demand. It, it's, it takes away money from the police department from those 200 vacant positions where the money's just sitting and demanding all those things. So Defund CPD took responsibility for the 20th Ward. We launched on June 19th, and we did a huge canvas in Washington Park, and we just began to have conversations with people. We began to hear stories from community around what they needed and what they didn't have and what they might want and what that would look like, and also to tell them, like, we are trying to get something on the ballot, and we need your signature so that the city can understand and really, like, hold what the community members want. And we had over 3,500 conversations of people who were just like, I want this. I used to go to that clinic. It's no longer there. I have to drive an hour and a half to another place. Or I call 311 because I don't want to call 911. And they send out a detective. And I'm having a crisis. They send out a detective who can't do nothing for me. So it's just been very clear from the community that the loss of these centers has deeply been felt. And wanting something that is near and close, um, that is free, that is accessible. Um, that is 24-7, that they can drop in at any time. 
that has just been very clear from all the conversations we've been having. And we got enough people to say yes, to sign that petition. And that meant that we could get the referendum on the ballot. And so now we are in our persuasion and our get out the vote stage, where we're not only letting folks know in the 20th war that this is going to be on the ballot and they should look for it and answer it by saying yes, you know, they want to, <laughs> um, but they do want to. And also like supporting folks, what do you need to get to the polls? Do you need a ride? Do we need to follow up with you to give your reminders? So that's where we have been and we have one week left and it's been moving and it's been feeling good. And we just have been also been developing a lot of leaders and organizers as well, Black organizers, which has been feeling really amazing as well. That's really exciting. I want to, I'm, I'm really eager to dig into the organizing lessons, but first I want to just like do a little quick, like funky breakdown for me, if you can. <laughs> just for folks who may not be familiar with political processes, legislative processes, what is a referendum? Can you kind of just like a basic understanding of what is that tool? Yeah, so a referendum is basically, there's like a single question that the folks who are of, within our context, the 20th Ward, folks who are living and registered to vote in the 20th Ward have the chance during a general election to vote on the single political question. It's asking the people directly what they want or they don't want rather than having it be something that is like policy that's put out and folks have to just then deal with afterwards. Right, so it's so it's a way to assert like political will, public opinion that is formal and documented. So it's different than like a survey or a bunch of people clicking a link or doing something on Twitter. This is going to be formalized in the record of where the voting populace stands. Follow up question, and there may be someone else we need to to check in with. But why is it limited to these three wards? Why the twenty of six and thirty third ward? Why are the other forty seven not getting asked this? Yeah, th- we're using this as as a pilot. So we knew based on the capacity and the ability of the folks who are part of this coalition what they could take responsibility for, have the like the capacity for, and also wanting to test this out on a smaller level to see how it works and how we then hold the city accountable. Yeah, wanted to take on the right size amount of work and very much chose the 20th Ward because of its large population of Black folks, Black and Brown folks, and because it also housed one of the clinics that were shut down. So it's being used as a pilot. It's being used as a way to like test um, and debrief and learn from our strategy and strengthen it. And yeah, this being a place of practice and experimentation, allowing that to guide how we do our organizing post the selection cycle. Now, now this is the this is the, the the scrumptious part for me. This is what I'm really excited about. One of the lessons that's hold true for me in in my organizing experience, but in talking to a bunch of folks here on Ergo, one of the greatest values from our efforts often gets underappreciated, right? Like this is so important because it's going to create this record because it's a step towards getting resources to people that really need it. It's a, it's a way to engage community. Um, but what I believe is that most organizing efforts are a space that transform the participants. So the people that show up to get the signatures, the people that are going around having these conversations, the people that are phone banking. It's one thing to believe I want to take resources from violent systems and invest them into other institutions. It's another thing to talk to hundreds of people about it, get their experience, have somebody maybe challenge you, and then you have to like figure out how to respond in real time and say something you weren't prepared to say that now you've learned about your own thinking, right? Like that's something that that I've seen happen. So what are some of those transformations, learnings, buildings that have happened from talking to these thousands of folks about this liberatory pursuit to get investment into our communities? What, what, what have you seen develop? One thing that has been very clear, the deepening understanding of the ways policing shows up, that is not just people who have guns or prisons or jails, deepening our understanding of the ways that police have never been able to hold the type of responsibility that has been given to them. And that has been clear from folks having to figure out how to respond to questions like, this is actually back in 2020 when we were talking about defund the police. And somebody was like, what do I do if I am a a person who is a survivor of intimate partner violence? And like, I don't know who else to call. Like, what what are your suggestions for that? And like having to pause and be like, that's valid. 
that's real. What I'm hearing from you is that police are not the people who you in need in those moments, but with like not understanding who else to call or who else can support or what else can be done. That is often our only option. And like moving deeper into that conversation, the places in which she has felt self has been from family, from community, from people who have like been able to like show up for her at the moment that it's happening, who are able to provide meals, who are able to provide transportation and just rides that, yeah, I think our organizers are really expanding their understanding of the ways that policing works to like take away options and possibilities from people and to be very, very narrow-minded as they are our first responders. They're the people who we, if anything at all is happening, somebody is sick, we call the police. Somebody's having a mental health crisis, we call the police. And understanding and figuring out how to communicate that to people that are saying, I want the police, the police are here for safety, doing some interrogation of when have they kept you safe and how have they kept you safe, and other moments of not feeling safe or other moments of harm and conflict, who are the people that could like tap into you the most, who could support you the most, who could care for you the most in ways that actually felt affirming and good? I've just seen folks who are working on this campaign, who are doing phone banking, who are canvassing and asking questions of community this question of safety, what it actually looks like and how we stop giving over responsibility to police when consistently they show that they can't hold those things for us. Part of what I think is unique about this is that there already was a set of smaller institutions that existed that you're fighting to return to or bring back or reinvest in, which is different from a lot of the other campaigns. Um, and, And so I'm wondering Let's say, you know, this referendum leads to the win that we hope and and we're working toward. What do y'all want to see or or what should we be fighting for to be in those buildings that maybe wasn't there when they got closed? Yeah, for sure. So what currently happens is that the city of Chicago is giving funding to mental health services and Lori Lightfoot has often focused on nonprofit providers to provide care which is essentially a way to take away responsibility from the city and its financial resources to care for its people. What we're asking for, what we want to see, and what we believe is really crucial and important is for for this to be publicly funded and publicly accessible rather than spending millions of dollars in private institutions that are inaccessible, like they're expensive and they require that you do have health care. We want a place that is not expensive and does not require you to have to have health care in order to receive support. What we also know about uh, private institutions is that there are many language barriers. There are so many people who are Spanish speakers and other people who speak other languages, and they can't access these private clinics because they don't have people who can translate or they don't care enough to understand that the city has many people of it and in it who are from many different places. And location barriers. We used to have these the centers be in neighborhoods, be close, like people could walk five minutes to them. And now folks have to get on a bus and a train and go an hour and a half. So we, we also want to make sure it's like it's close and it, it accessible by public transportation as well. And we want it also to, to be accountable to the community. Private institutions are not accountable. And we, we know all these things because CCW, that coalition collaborative for community wellness, called all the agencies, these private agencies, and found out that 17 of them did not serve undocumented residents and 25% didn't provide for folks who didn't have any type of insurance. And then less than half of them provided free services. So we want free. We want not to have insurance. We want you not to have like a citizen status in order to receive care. And we want to make sure that community members have the ability to hold these institutions accountable. And we know that it's going to be possible if it's housed in the Chicago Department of Public Health, because we can get access to the data and have like community advisory councils. Something we also want community advisory councils at each center that is composed of people who actually live in that neighborhood and are of that place. And what we also want in these centers, we want to think about the people who are working in them. We want to think about the the healthcare, the mental health professionals, the, the providers, these crisis intervention workers. We want them to be invested in. We want them to have a living wage. We want them to have more capacity. We want to give the workers the option to be in unions. We want these centers to be held by high quality, long term workers. And that's only possible if we use this as an intervention against burnout and high turnover that we often see happen in nonprofits. And we, we want the, the city to pay for it. We don't want these short-term grant fundings that often are given to nonprofits, which, again, just allow their workers to be underpaid and under-resourced. 
we also just want a place for folks to be able to drop in at any point. It's 24 seven at any point when they're experiencing a type of crisis for there to be a place and people to care and love up on them. Um, Cause right now Cook County jail is the largest mental health provider in the whole United States. And this is because of a reliance on police to respond to mental health crises. We want these centers to, to also acknowledge and understand and emphasize and hold the importance of peer support um, and also the role of community in care. Um, and for this not to be just like folks who have gone through traditional institutions of learning to learn how to be mental health providers, but are very much included, even on these intervention teams that are sent out to people who are experiencing crises for there also to be peer support and community involved in every step of the way. So folks feel held by the people who are around them and safety in their neighborhoods and their communities as well. This is all so powerful, pun intended. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> We're insufferable, I know, but trust me, it'll be worth it when this is out in the world. <laughs> There's value. Um <laughs> Because, you know, the, the the work that the campaign is doing right now, I think, is really exemplifying, demonstrating, embodying the transformative potential and capacity of our abolitionist movements, right? The the, the fact you just named or that reality was so challenging for me or, or made me so committed to abolition and learning Cook County was the nation's largest mental health provider and just how inhumane that is of a reality. And now that's been known for close to 10 years and remains the reality, right? And, and, and so there's a, a intentionality to the deprivation. That is oppression, right? Uh, in, in clear form. But also what, the, what the, the campaign is doing, you know, our movement is, yes, of course, in opposition to police and carceral violence and harm, but is also a generative thrust that has been advocating for investments in education and healthcare and other support services. And unfortunately, as our messaging gets filtered to a lot of community, that part gets missed or is not realized, right? Like folks don't realize that the folks that are talking about defund or abolition are the ones promoting for healthcare. And so similar to the question I asked earlier about how talking to all these thousands of people challenged or expanded organizers' understanding of what it means to say they're for abolition. What has talking to all these people in Chicago who we have collectively been experiencing crisis and trauma taught folks about the need of mental health? What has been learned about the need for mental health resources from people? Yeah, that's a really good question. One thing that has been clear, I remember a conversation I was having with a houseless person who was talking about the same story I said before around they called you and one, they sent out a detective moved into a conversation around like the rounding up of people, of houseless people who are looking for a place to sleep, for food to eat, and locking them up instead of providing housing and food without confinement. Also from these conversations, because of the closure of these mental health centers, just knowing how many people are locked up because they do have mental illness and those that can be in a jail or a prison or involuntary detention at mental health facilities. This also very much hits close to myself because I was in a psych ward at a hospital about a month ago. And while I was there, I saw a black teenage boy who was in the psych ward and who was in crisis get arrested because he was trying to navigate being in an unfamiliar place that he was unable to leave because he was put in this room with no windows, because he was protecting himself from this, this white nurse who was being really loud and inconsiderate. I just listened how they were criticizing his mother for having to leave and return because she had other children to care for, shamed her for trying to protect her son. I watched from the hallway in a hospital gown for six plus hours, surrounded by five to six cops who were just speaking really horribly about this person who was in crisis. And the best thing that they could do for this young black teenage boy was to put him in jail. When he left, I was put in his room. I was transferred to this private hospital and was told that I couldn't leave I had to stay there for at least five days and that I had to comply in order to get out. And I, as well as the other people who were there, were strip searched. We had no autonomy over our bodies. We had no privacy. And I was watching as the healthcare workers who were underpaid and who were overwhelmed and who were not trained, just like heavily drugged people. They held people down to inject them with something to quiet their confusion and their rage. They sent this houseless person who was inside for being in crisis 
away after her, her multi-day confinement with $30 and a bus ticket and told her that it was her fault for being a drug user when she was saying that they couldn't just send her out there with nothing and expect her not to end up there again. Um, well, we had to like pace in the hallways because we weren't allowed outside. We were forced to be in our rooms when they wanted to or in sessions where we, and there are a lot of people in there who were there for suicidality planning and attempts and more. We were asked if we could change a personality trait about ourselves. What would we change? And that was like our mental health session that they moved us through. What we would change about ourselves. And also we couldn't get released on, on weekends because the private hospital didn't get paid on those days. So what has been learned about the need for mental health in the day-to-day is like the only option for people right now is to go into these hospitals and volunteer or volunteer, but not be able to leave until a judge deemed it so, until a judge told them that they could leave. And not having a 24-7 drop-in center where if you are in crisis at any time of the day, this is a place for you to go where there will be people, but also you get to leave if you need to. I think what was needed was to feel affirmed and shown care and love. The place needed more money so they can provide proper meals and give enough food. We needed a place that had like access outside of our floor. And there are many of us in there who are having conversations around like, what would it be like if the staff weren't overworked? If they had protection from a union, if if our treatment included peer support and community rather than just being drugged up. And that's really what we're trying to have exist within these centers, for it to be very holistic and have multiple routes of care. Um, and then not only being medication, like our, the goal isn't just to like treat something away as if like mental illness is something bad or, or negative or we want to like get rid of. And that's often how drugs are used, medical drugs are used to like either quiet or to numb people or to make people compliant. And what we're wanting from these centers is is actually not that at all. Yeah. Mostly I think about the other times that I have been in mental health crisis or people that I know and it being exasperated because of panic of, of not knowing where to go late at night or who could help or where 24 seven care support and drop in could happen other than going to a psychiatric hospital, a place for so many reasons that I knew would not help me a place I knew and understood as an extension of the state um, and as a site for violence, a place where one of the patients inside called it a prison. Just what are the possibilities of having more options and for the people I trust and care for being allowed to be a part of my treatment plan as well, rather than just phone calls I get to have every couple hours and then not have any type of access to the outside world at all. Those are just some of the things that these centers would allow for, for sure. I, I want to take a breath in and one, just thank you for that honesty and vulnerability and sharing your own experience and the violence that you endured and observed others endure, especially in your time of need for like any of the politics. Like, I'm very sorry that you had to experience that. And I am um, grateful or in awe of the way in which you just named that experience as a grounding to advocate for community and for our, our world and our people. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm like hesitant in like follow-up questions and more just in a place of appreciation and reverence. And also that that's really fucked up. And I'm really sorry that, that you, that you went through that, especially in your time of need. So uh, thank you. And I'm sorry. Of course. Yeah. I mean, what was, what was clear to me is the only way I made it through and then made it out was because of all the people who are calling me literally every hour. <laughs> um, I was always getting a phone call. I know the staff's getting annoyed, but the people who are calling me and checking in, Asha Ransby Sporn had, <laughs> had lawyers on deck, <laughs> was ready to go. Um, and then also the people who were who were inside with me, we were we were the, each other's safety, and we were each other's processing. And it it wasn't at all the people who were there. It was folks who were also going through crisis, who were having a hard ass fucking time, and the people who loved us and wanted to care for us, but had very limited access to it. But like showed up whenever and however they could. It, it's very clear that it was it was community and, and friends and family and people. And that's what should be invested into and supported exactly. and exactly. organized so that you don't have to be fortunate to have that, right? That that is supported and socialized into how we relate to each other. Well, thank you for your 
work and self fighting for that for yourself and the other people uh, in your world, both close and far um, through this campaign. And I'm sure all the other parts of your life. Um, is there anything else that folks should just on the nuts and bolts should know about November 8th, any other info about what it'll look like on the ballot, anything like that, that we want to make sure we include or ways they can plug in in the next few days, you know, as we come down to the wire to help. Is there any last support needed? There is absolutely so much support needed. And we are out on the streets every day, twice a day. We have more afternoon and evening shifts for canvassing where we're door knocking and having conversations with people. We're stopping people on the street and having conversations where putting yard signs and um, door, what's they called? Door, the things you put on the door yeah, handles. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the things that you go things. when the you little, get home, you're like, things. oh, damn, all right. <laughs> yeah, the you digs. Yeah, the you digs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I believe that's the technical term. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We got that. So we got folks out every day having conversations with people that we definitely need some more Black and Latin, a Latinx people to sign up for and join us in. We have trainings. We have people we can pair you with to support you in communicating to 20th Ward residents just why this is so important and why we really want their vote and how this is going to help ourselves and each other and our people. And then we also have phone banking that's happening where we're calling a whole bunch of people, literally thousands, to let them know that this is actually on the ballot. A lot of folks don't know. And, you know, it's going to be on the last page. And some people don't click all the way through or like they, you know, they finished what they, they knew they were there to do. And then they click all the way to the end. They just submit it. We want people to know that's on the ballot and that they should vote yes on it. But we need people on the phones and we need people on the streets, as many people as possible. And so if you are down and interested, we would love to have you. Um, and there is a link to sign up. Don't know how how we can get that through. We'll throw it. We'll throw it in the show notes so folks can find it yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Bet. We'll make sure folks have that. So yeah, so folks, please sign up. Also, note we're going to do a follow up when the results come in because, like you named, right? Like this is not the end result. This is a way to move forward, and this will inform what's happening in the mayoral election coming up in February. So if you're hearing this and you're like, "Oh man, the eighth is coming up or it's passing." but you want to get involved, there will be more opportunities with the campaign. So definitely stay in tune. And also, if you're hearing this and you're not in Chicago or you're not near these three wards, this is also important for everybody who believes or supports these transformative trajectories, right? Like if you're in a different city, this is a model or this is kind of the nuts and bolts of what it looks like to organize in the formal sense of the political arena for redistributive policy, right? And so even if you can't touch Chicago, like start to have this conversation with people in your community, in your city, in your locality or municipalities. And this is an effort that needs to be happening in, in other places. Anything else, Delane, that we, that we didn't hit or that we want to catch? You know, we want public clinics, not private. We want a, a, a no core responded model. We don't want to have more engagements with the police. Anything else you want to make sure folks got? Yeah, I think this whole thing is really also just pushing us to realize we got to stop believing that people deserve to be punished for their humanity, for struggling, for trying to figure out how to survive, and that we've been taught that police are first responders to harm and conflict, but another response is possible. And they're, you know, just like thinking about our own lives the multiple ways in which we have ourselves been in crisis. We were super sick, super sad. We had an emergency and the people we dialed was not 911. It wasn't the police, but it was like, you know, just family, community, friends. We relied on community to care for our children, for our elders, all those things. Just, I think just want to like really steep ourselves. As Mary M. Kaba and Andrea Ritchie have, have said before in their book, No More Police, just came out, y'all go get it that policing is so connected to our ideas of what safety is. Um, and it's hard to disentangle that, but as a number of people who are taken from us by the hands of the police, by the guns of the police continues to increase, it's just really clear how policing is synonymous with violence. It's just true. And police reform or policies like corresponder models continue to fail. And using that as like a launching point to support ourselves and our people to understand that we need a different approach to safety and that, you know, we need care, not cops and, and treatment, not trauma in this campaign, really trying to illuminate 
that who got us, we got us, and it's not it's not the the agents of the state. Beautiful. Thank you for your um, for your brilliance and your generosity, and for being with us here today. We'll throw the links to sign up in the you know in the show notes and all that. Are there any other ways uh, that you'd like uh, you or the work of the campaign to be found? Yeah, so you can find more about um, the coalition and the work that is doing the coalition, the Co- collaborative for community wellness. Um, we can also send out that link, but it's just www.collaborativeforcommunitywellness.org. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter. That might be it. At <laughs> That's enough. That's enough. Come on, people. Yeah, Come yeah, down, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> you happen to have socials, which I do not. Um, but I do know the deep and does and it'd be popping on there. Yeah. Those little places. Well, again, I want to just reiterate my appreciation and gratitude. I have been seeing you for many years, but definitely this last year or so have been seeing the the investment and pour in to this work and your dedication. Um, So I just want to say thank you for all the work that you are doing and have done. And also, as I'm thanking you, I want to thank all of the folks who have been working so hard in the campaign, particularly over these last five, six months to really make this possible. Um, And then beyond the organizing, again, um, in this conversation, I'm really grateful for how you shared your humanity with us and really talked to the true need that our people have and are facing. And so, again, much love and much appreciation for all that you are and all that you do. I appreciate that so much. And want to send that love back to you. The Breathing Room Space has been our headquarters for the last week and for this last week of Get the Vote. And I know all the work and love and care that you've poured into that and the Let Us Breathe Collective and how a lot of this is also possible because of the abolitionist organizing that has been happening um, before we even touch treatment, not trauma, and like really laying the groundwork for what is possible. And also for folks to be amped up already and like in the conversations of defund that allow this to really moves treatment not trauma and this idea to move in a little bit easier to folks' minds because they've been they've been prepped for it. They've been primed for it because mm. of y'all's work. Mm. People say, people threw I, I a couple of your digs that. up there in the past, you know. It wasn't <laughs> nobody's first you dig, you know. There's been some you dig. And also we gotta we we gotta have some type of I don't know if it's an audio story, some like family history of the powerful family. Like this sounds like black and canto style on the island in Jamaica. Like, what was Grandma Powerful doing? Like, I need to know all of the different powerful. The questions have been asked that people don't really know. <laughs> oh, ooh, ooh. Time to... so a little mystical element uh-huh. there. Yeah, yeah. Some, some, some figurative fiction. There we uh-huh. go. I love it. Yeah, the powerfuls has to come out. So we'll we'll talk about that <laughs> offline. That's a whole different podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, family. Thank you again. Uh, we're as always where to go radio. Uh, make sure you get out on the eighth and vote in support. And we'll be back on the line soon, reshaping the culture of our city and world for the more liberatory and creative. Much love to the people. Peace. (laughs)